So our next speaker is, uh, we have Karen Bennett and Johan Hugervorst on your agenda. Karen is in Vietnam. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere warm and buggy. Um, so we have Johan, who's going to do an admirable job in her stead. They work together on sort of a pilot process on the Sweet Home Ranger District that is a little bit different way of looking at landscapes and having all lands concepts and integrating all kinds of stuff. And it got really complex, and he will tell you all about it. Um, in 20 minutes. In 20 minutes or less. Um, out on the table, there is a printout of this process. Um, if you would like one mailed to you, put your name on the list out there, and we will get it to you. Um, but in the meantime, let me... Let me find you. You are cool soda. I am. He's the cool dude. Here you go. So help me welcome Johan Hogevorst, the forest hydrologist on the Willamette. Well, good morning. Uh, yeah, Karen, for those of us that have had the privilege to work with Karen Bennett over our careers, um, it's not surprising hey, where's Karen this week? Oh, she's in Vietnam. And the answer is just, oh, okay. She, uh, she's a jet setter. She goes in a number of different places. Um, just to, to give some kudos to her, she was a big part of the project that I'm going to show you. Uh, very helpful to our team in developing this process um, that I'm going to show you for Cool Soda. And so um, just wanted to put a shout out to her. And we miss her today, but I'll do my best to carry the torch. Uh, Cheryl, you didn't show me how to advance. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in. So traditional Forest Service assessments, this is what we affectionately refer to as the NEPA Triangle. Uh, we send our projects through this, and not unlike the uh, Bermuda Triangle, every once in a while, the project goes in and does not return. Uh, but when you look at the, the old NEPA Triangle, and all of us Forest Service people, we started with the Forest Service and were taught this triangle very soon uh, after we arrived. But on the left side of that triangle is proposal development. It's a stage where we think about um, usually a landscape and what are we going to do with this? What's the scope and scale? What is our purpose and need to do treatments within this forested landscape, usually for the Forest Service? And we develop a proposed action that then on the right side of the triangle is put out for scoping to our publics she kind of says, you know, here's the general idea for what we're going to be doing on the landscape, and we'd like your feedback and your, um, your issues related to this. We develop alternatives, we write up the effects, we have our findings, and then in the bottom right-hand corner, a decision is signed by folks like John Allen and by district rangers, line officers. And then we notify the public of the final decision. There is an appeal period, and if we are fortunate to have done our homework and worked with our publics properly, we get to implement our project and then monitor and evaluate that. And so I want to point out specifically to the, the proposal development side there. Traditionally in the Forest Service, uh, and these are, these are kind of generalizations, but traditionally that proposal development has been silviculturally driven. What I mean by that is if, if we're working on a forest, the forester is really the one that's going to tell us these areas, these discrete areas, these units are the places that we want to focus on our treatment. And the other specialists on that interdisciplinary team kind of respond to that or react to that. Uh, ties to the landscape processes were weak. And so we did, after the Northwest Forest Plan, begin to work with larger landscape LSR assessments, late successional reserve assessments, and watershed analysis, which tried to bring that kind of landscape scale thinking into our projects, and to some degree it did, but still kind of weak. And then oftentimes it didn't meaningfully involve the public at that left side of the triangle uh, stage. Now that being said, I think over the last 10 years, at least on the Willamette, we've made improvements in that. We're getting our publics out on the ground during that proposal development stage to talk about what we're thinking, um, we're starting to use many of the tools that are going to be discussed today in this workshop. And so I think we're getting better at that. But what I want to show you today is a little different approach for that left side of the triangle, of the NEPA triangle. And it's called the, the charrette process, or design charrette. And the concept here is that it's, it's an intensive effort to, to finish a design project. And the term charrette comes from uh, French architecture schools, 
where literally charrette means cart. And if you look at that little cartoony diagram there on the upper right side there, what you see are a group of students in one of these French architecture schools. Uh, they, they've been working on a project and they're wheeling it out on a cart, on a charrette. And they're uh, approaching this, uh, this community of interest. They're sharing their knowledge of what they've done with this, uh, this project that they're working on. They receive feedback from that community of interest and then they go back to their drawing room and they work on it some more. And then it's iterative. They bring it out on the cart, they show it, go back in, work on it. That's kind of the concept with, with a design charrette. And so Karen Bennett and I worked together for some time on the Sayusla National Forest. And we used this design charrette approach for uh, watershed restoration projects. So we would have larger scale watershed restoration projects with some complexity to them. We would hire a group of five or six students from a number of universities to be on a team, one of these teams, and they would spend eight weeks intensively going through this kind of a process to come up with a, a conceptual design for the restoration. And so in one case, I worked on a, a project called Karnowski Creek, and we invested $20,000 of some federal funds into this team and then shopped this for grants to our normal sources of granting and returned $350,000 in grant funding for that project. And it was a four-year period where um, I was one of the people that helped implement that project. And so last year in 2012, uh, Karen came to us on the Willamette and said, you know, we should try this design trip process with an interdisciplinary team, one that normally takes a project through that right side of the triangle for, for NEPA. And so uh, we chose the Sweet Home Ranger District and the Soda Fork sub-watershed. And we worked on a project called Cool Soda. So some of the steps for this cool soda charrette process. As mentioned, we designated the project area, a team leader, and in this case we had two co-team leaders, which I'll show you, and then a core team of folks that were going to work uh, kind of these, how do I go out oh, there, up. So the people in the cartoon, the, the core team were those folks with the cart, rolling it out and kind of doing the hard work on the project. And then we had many consultants around that core team that could give advice and give information to this team. And then we also had a community of interest. Those were the stakeholders, our publics, our interested parties. And I'll show you a list of some of those people. Then the first thing, once we assembled this team and kind of defined the roles, was to have a knowledge transfer. And it's really an intensive introduction uh, to this area that we were looking at. And so I'll show you that. And then uh, thirdly, we entered kind of this phase of collective learning where we're meeting with our community of interest and they're giving us feedback in a series of these pinups, rolling the cart out, showing them what we've been working on, getting feedback, taking it back and, and working on it. And kind of in line with both what Tom and John just talked about there in point number three, uh, the investigation and data collection including cultural, ecological, social, and economic. So all aspects of how that project might affect the community of interest. Finally, we start to develop a restoration design concept. Again, getting feedback from that community of interest, and we end with a graphic report of what that design is. And so all of this takes place on that left side of the triangle before we start our NEPA process. So our project area, I apologize, this map is a little bit fuzzy. Oh no, now I gotta find my laser. Black button in the middle. Black button in the middle. Black. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we got Oregon here. This lime green thing is Lynn County. So we're on the west slope of the Cascades, the wet side. We're within the South San Am sub-basin of the Willamette Basin. And if you go all the way down, you see this, for all you hydros out there, this is a sixth field watershed. And so 15,000 acres-ish, something like that. Uh, and then I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. It just shows you what this looks like. At the bottom here is Highway 20. Sweet Home is to the left. So this is on your way up into the Cascades, going up over the top. And if you notice, the, uh, the land management pattern here is checkerboard. And so one objective, uh, one of many objectives we had with this project was to also think in terms of all lands, both private and public. 
In this particular project area, in this Soda Fork drainage, about 60% of it is private industrial and 40% public lands, Forest Service. Uh, a couple other things. Um, here at the mouth of Soda Fork is about 1,400 feet elevation. Up here, Harder Mountain, upper right, is uh, about 4,800, so quite a, an elevation climb there. Have a little piece of uh, the Menagerie Wilderness here within the project area. And that's about what I want to show you. Okay, so we did assemble that core team. Uh, six people. I mentioned that um, Anita Leach and myself were co-team leaders. And we had a watershed specialist, a fish bio, trustworthy ecologist, wildlife biologist, and a person that handled cultural heritage and recreation. So that's that kind of core team. Then also, because it was an all-lands approach, we had uh, three members of Cascade Timber Consultants, the, pri the predominant private industrial uh, land manager within this project area. And so Dave Furtwangler was the president of this company, which was pretty amazing to have him in the room at the table talking ideas with us about how we could work collaboratively Forest Service-wise. We really don't have a lot of opportunities to do that kind of a thing. So quite a treat. And then a couple of his guys, Milt and Bill, join us as well. And then some kudos out to Jeremy Hobson. He's our GIS analyst. You'll see some of his maps, as well as in Brett Blunden's presentation. Uh, really gifted analyst. Community of interest, I'm not going to read through all of these, but um, suffice it to say, we had lots of local participation, some state folks. We had three universities involved, a uh, strong tribal component, and then a number of special interests that um, come usually to our table and talk to us about the kinds of projects that we do. So that was our community of interest to present our ideas to. So once our team was assembled and we knew kind of who our stakeholders would be, we started with the knowledge transfer part of this process. And what that involves is, uh, we used to call it in the Sayus of the brain dump. For about a week, we assemble as many speakers and experts on this particular area as we can assemble. And so we spent a little time in the field. We had a day on vegetation dynamics. Uh, Tom Spees came and talked to us about this area. Wildlife habitat, another day. Watershed and aquatic sciences and heritage and cultural resources. So in all, we had 38 speakers over five separate days. And believe me, at the end of this, you are exhausted. But what you've done as a core team is you've heard from all these experts, not just about your own resource, but about everyone else's as well. And you're kind of starting to learn as a team and gel as a team as you hear all these different things. And then we kind of moved into that collective learning phase where um, we have these pinups with our community of interest. And so the first one, we kind of discussed the inherent, in, inherent capacity of the landscape. So what did this uh, landscape look like over time? Uh, what did it look like before human settlement? What are the kinds of ecosystem services that you would find in this landscape? Just becoming very familiar and sharing that with our community. Also at that first pinup, this is a public meeting, or a couple public meetings actually, um, we solicited from them, what are your values? What's most important to you in this landscape? And heard from that and recorded all that. By the second one, we were starting to discuss with this community of interest the existing condition. What does it look like now? What, what are kind of the conditions for each of the resources? And then kind of refining those community values. You know, this is kind of what we recorded last time. Is this, is this what you feel about what's important about this landscape? So you're starting to see where, um, like John Allen talked about, you're kind of building that trust with your local community. By the third collaborative pinup, we had some draft restoration ideas for how we want wanted to uh, improve conditions on the landscape and kind of maximize our ecosystem services from this landscape. And then by the fourth pinup, we had a final restoration design that we presented to this community of interest. And so just to give you an idea of the kinds of things um, during our brain dump and during the kind of collective learning process, we looked at ge geology, soils, and landforms, um, noticed some very interesting things. I want to point one area out to you here. Um, I won't go too far into the geology part of it, but Harder Mountain up here was in a past epic event where um, lava basically flowed from that vent and filled an entire drainage here. 
So you have this just amazing, when you look at it on LIDAR, it's just this big flat right up in the steep section of this watershed. So what are the implications of that? What, how does water travel through that? Um, what's happening with that? Whereas you compare it to this side here where it went forward. Whereas you compare it to this side and you've got more rocky cliffs and tufts and breaches, very different type of geology. How does this affect how we think about this landscape? The same thing for the hydrology. As a result of some of that geology and soils, uh, looking back at that kind of basalt flat in here, not much stream development. Uh, you've got groundwater being stored there and released in this main stem. How does that affect your, your hydrology? Whereas over here, steep, flashy system, how does that affect the types of culverts you're putting in your roads? So what you see is we're kind of developing the whole body of information and, and putting it together uh, before we go on to think about what we want to do on this landscape. Same thing for fisheries resources. Brett's going to share some NetMap with you, but these were some runs for NetMap. Our uh, project area is here, and essentially the, the Salmonid intrinsic potential is highest there towards the bottom of the main stem. So we're, we're aware of that, and we start to plan for what we do for Steelhead and for Chinook. Historic vegetation, same thing, plant association groups. So elevationally dependent, you've got up here in the top elevation, specific silver fir, hemlock, start to get down to moist hemlock here at the bottom. How does that affect how we view this landscape and the vegetation? So you're getting the idea, we're, we're kind of building the, the background, the foundation. Fire regimes, same things, very different on the, on the top elevations as towards the bottom where it's wetter. A very interesting map here that Ray Davis brought from, uh, for us um, when he spoke to us. This is a 1914 map, and again, hearkening back to what John Allen talked about on the east side there, just over the hill from us. Uh, if you look, squint a little bit, you see our project area here, and these kind of grayish-brown areas are areas that were mapped in 1914 as deforested burns. And so at the bottom third of our project area, it was completely deforested by fire, whereas the top was virtually untouched. Today, it's the exact opposite. It's intensively managed up here, both on past Forest Service management and current um, private industrial management, whereas this bottom end here is, is more of the critical spotted owl habitat. So change over time, thinking of long time scales and, and what changes over time. Historic wildlife species, we discussed that, thought about what was there originally, what was there now. Special habitat types, because of the mixed severity fire, the mixed severity burns in this area, lots of unique special habitats, different types of meadows, rock and talus areas, old vine maple areas, just a, a real diversity of special habitats in this particular area. And then, as if this wasn't complicated enough, being an all-lands approach on private and, and uh, federal and trying to use a new process with our IDT, we also try to put on top of this some sort of representation of the ecosystem services on this landscape. I think a lot of, a lot of people out there, what we kind of saw as we were doing this process, are really hungry to, to see a way of communicating uh, ecosystem services and how um, we affect those services and how we maximize them coming off the landscape. Uh, for the benefit of not only humans, but also for uh, all users of that landscape. And instead of ecosystem services, we chose to, to label them benefits from nature. We worked with Nicola Smith out of our regional office, and she kind of helped us um, pull some of those values from the, the community of interest and kind of represent those as these are the benefits from nature that we get from this landscape. And so we did a number of things trying to portray those benefits from nature. We didn't end up using this graphic in our proposal, but it was just kind of part of a process of thinking kind of where you fit these different types of ecosystem services that come from this landscape and represent it back to your community that's concerned about many of these things. So once we went through that collective learning process, got a lot of feedback from our stakeholders, our community of interest, we decided to represent uh, the, the project potential or the restoration potential in three different themes. Uh, streams and wild fish is the first one, forests and wildlife, 
and the third one is uh, community and culture. And so just looking at a couple of these in the streams and wild fish, just to give you an idea of kind of the linkages, um, kind of a small map to see, squint a little bit if you're sitting in the back there, Meg. But uh, for instance, down here where we had high intrinsic potential for um, salmonid habitat, um, it's pretty much bedrock at this point in time. There have been some debris torrents that come through and really changed the character and nature of this. And so we started to think about, well, what could we do to stabilize um, roads within this area? Also upsize culverts so we get better transport of uh, substrate gravel to, to create the spawning beds that we want. We also identified trees within the riparian area here that we'd like to pull over, whole trees with root wads attached and create those key pieces to, to help set up the, the gravel that we need. Um, we're also looking at managed stands within the Forest Service areas here and here where we can do some treatment for uh, riparian improvements because they're very dense stands. Looking at, again, sources of large wood that are going to feed this place that we're restoring for the long term. So this is an area of mature forest that is going to be our source area for wood over the long term. So the picture I'm trying to draw to you, for you, is the fact that we're kind of using all that information we gathered, developed it with our community, and kind of showing those linkages across the entire sub-watershed that we're working on. Something a little different than what we've usually done. Okay. And then on the right side there, um, when you look at the proposal, you'll see a bar there on the right for each one of these themes trying to highlight the jobs that would be created as part of the restoration. And so um, that was very important to our community of interest, particularly our local folks. Sweet Home is economically depressed in many ways, and whatever we can do to show that we are thinking about jobs and putting those on the landscape, getting people to work to do these things was very, very important to our community of interest. And so that's how we addressed it. We did the same thing for forests and wildlife. One thing I wanted to point out here is um, this kind of cactus-y looking thing with fingers. That is a wildlife corridor that we wanted to enhance. Again, instead of looking at individual units by themselves or thinking about just those, we're thinking about what we can do within these areas to enhance this corridor. This is more of a kind of a no-touch area for the Forest Service. It's just the reality of, of what we're working with. We're really not going to be doing much in in wilderness or anything adjacent to that, this is really the best option for old growth dependent species. So we chose this side, we're working on this corridor, we've got a whole series of projects that could address improving um, elk migration through this area from winter to summer range. Community and culture revolved a lot around roads, recreation, and tribal interests. So we tried to identify those areas where the tribes could do berry picking and uh, cedar bark is very important to them. So we identified those, we talked with the tribes about what they were looking for and they gave us that feedback. So in the very end of our proposal, we have a proposed action table. So if you remember the NEPA triangle, what comes out of that left side of the triangle is a proposed action that you bring forward. And so we, what you can't see as column headings in that table are, what are the landscape challenges, what are the restoration opportunities, what are the outputs, and what are the outcomes, what are the benefits from nature that would be affected, and what are the essential costs or revenues that would come from each of those projects. So an example is a restoration opportunity to install a bridge. The regular way that we would purport this is a half mile of stream restored. Pretty bland, that doesn't tell you much, but that's kind of how we report back to Congress about what we do. But there's a much richer story to be told about the true outcomes of this project. Written there, removes only a natural barrier in ESA listed fish stream. Um, allows key sources of durable gravel to enter fish habitat. Adds genetic diversity to isolated population. So trying to expand on what is it that's important about the outcomes of this particular project. So major outcomes, uh, fire protection actions for private lands, wildlife habitat enhancement along the identified corridor that I showed you, timber volume. Uh, this wasn't an area that had a, a lot, a great deal of potential for timber volume, 
But when we finished, there was a greater amount of volume that we could take from this landscape based on the projects that we had developed. An open dialogue with neighbors and community of interest and some excellent aquatic restoration opportunities. So as Cheryl mentioned, there is a copy of this proposal on a back table and a sign-up sheet if you'd like to uh, get a copy of this. We can send it to you once we get it printed. And that's my talk. Okay, so the question was, uh, have we implemented any of these projects yet? Were there any of these projects that would be considered controversial? And kind of where are we in the process? So we started this about a year ago. We took about four months of kind of intensive work with that core team. And we finally kind of finished that, finalized that proposal the first of this year. So we're in the process of moving into that NEPA phase. We've taken some projects off that proposed action table and done them immediately for, for NEPA to implement them this year. And then uh, we're gonna move forward with a larger environmental assessment for the rest of those projects. Um, there is some controversy. We talked it over very frankly with our community of interest, but I wouldn't say hugely controversial. We had a couple stands that were about 100 years old and there are elements of our community that don't really like going into stands that are 100 years old but we talked about the rationale, we talked about um, what we would do in those and had a pretty open, frank dialogue. Went to the field and actually stood in some of those stands and talked about them and, and worked with them. What's your feel for whether or not you're, you're gonna be allowed to implement those projects? I think we're gonna implement most of them, actually. It really is, I think I heard John talk about capacity. It really is, if do we have the capacity to, um, to get all these projects lined out and done um, but I think all of them have a very good possibility of being implemented. What we also did is, um, I didn't mention it, but in the proposal we listed kind of the whole world of ideas, like all the ideas we came up with, and then we took a subset of those that were kind of the next five years that we felt like we really had high likelihood of implementing these projects. Uh, yeah, but what kind of contribution do you get from the private landowners then? They make these commitments on treatments on their own. Uh, so the question was, what kind of contribution did we get from the private industrial land manager? Um, small steps. Small steps is what I would say we took. They were amazingly willing to sit at the table with us, which not all private industrials have been in the past for projects like this. And so they were very interested in fire protection. That really, their resource is their bottom line. So to protect their timber resource was their most important thing. And so we tried to really focus on that, and we did make some strides in doing that. Um, but I, I would say we need to accomplish a couple of these projects in the first round before we have kind of that next quantum jump to do some real, you know, more meaningful things on private lands. But I, I would just say that they were open and that we, we talked things over, and, and we did come up with some projects that are going to be meaningful for both. Johan will be here all day, so oh, you can corner him. There's a chat? Oh, yes. Good. Yes. Chat questions we shall okay, take. Okay, here it is. How sustainable of a process is this for both the public in terms of intensity of participation and for the Forest Service staff? And how replicable is it? Replicable and is sustainable. Is this process replicable and sustainable? That's a good question. Um, we would revise it slightly, I think. So we would, we would scale back certain parts of how we did it. But I think it is transferable and sustainable. I think you can do it. Uh, we presented this project to Meg and to Gordy, our, our forest supervisor and deputy forest supervisor. And what they identified was, if we do these steps on the left side of the triangle, we're gonna shorten our time on the right side of the triangle. So they saw it as an investment early on to build the trust and support that would take less time on the right side of the triangle. So, if we can continue using something like this, I think we can get there, do that. Thank you very much, yeah. Johan.
Well, I'm going to show my age. My, the first model I ever learned was called Snap. Does anybody else in here remember Snap? Used to be the most, the most powerful person on an IDT was the road engineer. And the first product that would be given to the IDT was where all the roads could go. That was it. This is where all the roads could go. And then the forester would decide where the highest valuable stands were on the roads where those roads would go. Um, we're, we've come a long way since, since then. The first time I did invite an engineer to an IDT, he was really, really, really pissed at me. 